Okay, so welcome to this uh, NJMON user meeting. We also do a bit of uh, NMON on the side for um, the people using the older tools before they move up to the full grown, full fat uh, tools that we're now working on. It's just a little reminder for uh, NJMON, it's open source from, from IBMers to benefit those that have got big power machines, you know, IBM power based machines. And for those running Linux on anything, uh, we're not proud, we'll work with anything. Uh, here's a little diagram where we have an NJMON collector on Linux AX, or a thing called a virtual IO server. That's the uh, <laughs> the server that virtualizes the IO on power boxes. It's actually running AIX, so it's one of the same, although there's some extra stats available for the virtual resources. We tend to put these into InfluxDB, an open source uh, database that captures all the data at high speed and allows you to pull out the data uh, directly if you want to. But most people will use uh, Grafana to draw your nice, beautiful graphs on your browser where you can instantly change what the stats you're looking at, how the colors are, how big it is on the screen, pull in extra data and dynamically work out what you want to look at. People tend to create a thing called a template in Grafana with their common set of databases, uh, of data from the database. And um, typically you have in the top left in here, you say like select which virtual machine you're getting the data from. So you can go put, very quickly change to other machines with the same set of graphs or to, uh, graphs if you want. Over here on the right, we have a list of all, all the performance stats that we uh, tend to gather, which is fairly extensive. On AX, on a small virtual machine, we're talking about 1,500. Uh, different stats every snapshot and for uh, linux we're talking around 800 or so we also can work because we're selecting the data output as json and we can also work with uh, elastic or elastic search or elk all the same uh, product uh, or splunk if you're into that and we can also take the data in line protocol this is what influxdb uses directly we can supply that straight to influxdb um, or if we go via something called Telegraph, we can actually connect it to Prometheus. A lot of people are into the Prometheus database and tools. Now that's important because uh, IBM bought Red Hat and Red Hat do a lot of um, OpenShift and OpenShift or uh, Kubernetes uh, likes Prometheus as their database engine. If you have hundreds and hundreds of containers, um, you can't keep the data for years. They're coming and going too fast, so you tend to use the like Prometheus, and it's uh, pretty ruthlessly efficient at throwing away old data. You only want to know what's happening right now, or maybe in the past couple of weeks, sort of time frame. Okay, down the bottom here we have the tinyurl.com njmon, and you can go and find out more about the uh, the project and uh, download all the source code. And we can also pre-compile for our power-based machines. Um, or uh, Intel, AMD 64 type machines, um, and even IBM Z when it's running Linux at least. If you want to get up to speed quickly, then there's now 10 videos out uh, here. I haven't updated these numbers actually. We're in September now, so they're all gone up a bit. Yeah, 12,000 people have been looking at these videos, so we're really popular. People are having a look at these. If you want to watch them all, and um, then it's two hours, 20 minutes to get through those. And you'll know well, <laughs> quite a lot at the end. I, I was jokingly handing out badges, which just means a little logo of uh, being NJ1 trained or N1 trained. If you watch all the videos I've created on a particular subject. Now, I, I work in the UK, England, um, and we have these things called English milestones. Every town as a milestone and it typically tells you how far away you are from london <laughs> as uh london's very important to the english but also with a sort of two local uh towns along the road that you're walking on interesting the one on the right it looks like it looks like a j but that is actually an old-fashioned one i presume they put a little tail on it otherwise it just might look like a crack in the in the stone or something but so this is 14 miles to one town and one mile to the uh, other one and these many date that back from uh, roman times they may actually be older than that in other parts of the world um but uh, we've re reached an important milestone with uh, nmon and njmon 
Um, it's all held on Source Forge. We've been tracking the numbers and we hit 1 million downloads um, over the weekend uh, on Saturday. Um, I, I was jumping up and down with joy and saying how great this was. And my wife was just looking at me like, oh, what a sad guy that I live with. And there we are. Some people get excited about these things. We must have done something right if a million people have downloaded it. And quite a lot of people will download one copy of Nmon or Njmon and then run it on 10 machines, 100 machines, 1,000 different uh, virtual machines in their computer room. So we're never quite sure what's going on. Now, over here for the Nmon side of things, Nmon for Linux was released in 2009. So it's only 11 years uh, worth of data. We were actually running for 10 years before that as, as well. as a, we, did, we were releasing just the binaries, not the actual open source. Uh, the famous analyzer for Enmon uh, didn't hit SourceForge until uh, 2018. It was held on Developer Works, which IBM decided to close down, and we lost track of how many downloads there was. Um, we have another one called Enmon Chart for graphing that, but this is old school, if you like. Um, if you're an AX user, then Enmon is actually installed by default now as part of the AX uh, installation, and it actually automatically runs it for you on AIX, and uh, that happened in 2008. That means after that, the, there was no more Nmon for AIX downloads, so we were sort of missing all those, and, and I guess they're going to be fairly high numbers. AIX is very popular uh, for big companies running big databases and big services. In the middle in here, we have the NJMon and the NIMon. The J means is when we're is used when we want to output uh, JSON data, and the I is used when we want to output the InfluxDB line protocol data. Otherwise, it's the same two programs, the same measures. And when the data actually gets to InfluxDB, it's exactly the same. They can be in the same database and all that. We've added this N measure in the past month, where if you were collecting all the operating system stats with NJMON or NIMON, but you've got your own stats. Perhaps you've got a database running and you want to say how many transactions a second you're doing and that sort of stuff. Then this N measure will put that data into the same database for you. And we have an NJMON chart similar to the MMON chart in here. It generates a HTML file, a web page with all the graphs embedded in it. And you can flick between 30 or 40 graphs that it does by default. And just for laughs, I've got this. Uh, uh, it's N web, but they're all stand for Nigel, right? Obviously, uh, I tend to call it my nano website. It's a tiny little program, see 200 lines of C code that will generate and uh, will make you a, a web server. There's actually about 100 lines of code and 100 lines of, of uh, debug and uh, monitoring and error reporting in there. So, if you want to see how to write a web server, then that's a little example you might want to do. It. And, I, and I hope a load of people use it for our own private little uh, web servers and uh, farming out some files anyway, just for fun. Right now, wh where what is our host name? Is it a fully qualified FQD and a fully qualified domain name, or should it give you the short name? If you type in host name, do you get a host name dot and then a domain name and then at the, t the last little bit in here is known as the root domain? Or should it output the short name like this, the blue part, and this is called the domain name? Well, a lot of people think they can make up their own minds. Well, it's not true. In practice, it's bad practice not to use the full host names. And we just hit this in part of the NJMon product. So we, project. So we had a, a user that has multiple virtual machines with the same short name. In my opinion, this is insane and error prone. So if you think uh, you've got a look, you've got a host out there with I don't know, a host name of Alpha 42, um, well, there'll be half a dozen of them virtual machines with that host name with different domain names, which is just asking for trouble, in my opinion. You're not quite, you know, if you log in and it says Alpha 42, you don't know where you are, or what, what the, the actual domain name is. And of course, with these days where we can move a virtual machine between servers, you may jump it between domains, and then you'll actually have two host names. <laughs> it just drives you, drives you uh, mad. So, um, 
So as a warning, if you are using short names, that is not a recommended approach. Uh, I'm not going to say it's illegal, but certainly dangerous for exactly this problem that this customer had. So he has multiple virtual machines with the same name. That means when you put the data into the Influx database, it thinks it, you know the data from five different machines are all got the same host name. And so if you try to draw a graph of <laughs> with the data from five different machines, the numbers are all over that place. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, it's just, just complete random junk in the database because of this uh, issue. If you go to AIX and you type in Smitty, which is a tool for doing making a systems administration very easy, and the networking, you get to this sort of panel where you're meant to type in the full host name like this. If you hit help, and you and it's the top of the help, it's not like it's hidden. Down in here it says if the host uses the domain name server for name resolution, the host name must contain the full domain name. Used to get into wars over this with some some users, and we just read out the manual pages. This is what you should do, and the answer is no. I like the short ones because it's sort of nicer. Well, the answer is no. It's just confusing, and at some point you're going to close the wrong server, wrong virtual machine down. So there's a workarounds for this user error that we've been working on. So if you're using NIMON, its work is sending the data straight to the Influx database. And um, we've added a minus H option to the command, which says even though when you ask for the host name as in the code, it's giving you a short name, go the extra mile to find out the fully qualified domain name and use that as the short name. So that's what it always should have been. So... Um, and in, actually, in the codes, we just used to say get the host name using the get host name function. Now we check if there's no dots in the host name, then we didn't get the the uh, that should be short host name. There, we didn't get the sh we've got the short host name, not the full host name. So then it uses another function using the short name to get you the fully qualified domain name, and that is used. It's called the tag that you send to actually the. Influx DB, so it does that. Now, in JMON, we can't do that because in the JSON data we generate, it has the uh, host name and it has in a different uh, place the uh, full host name. So it's, we don't actually create the tags in the output for in JMON. That is done when you run the in JMON daemon on usually the influx database machine and in here is actually pulling out these are all the tags that we use to give to the influx db when we insert the data uh, in his case it gets it pulls out the host name which will be the short name which is the wrong one if we change that in the python in ngmond to be the full host name then we'll actually get the full host name and we won't have this overlaying of the host name in the database. So two ways of working around something that we should never have seen in the first place, but there we are. And uh, this is Python, so you can just edit the file and rerun it and you'll get the new code. Okay. So controlling uh, NJMON and NIMON, in this case, is both the uh, same for both commands. Um, typically, we do something like this. This is um, this is doing it uh, sort of slightly old school. So, and NJMON maybe a snapshot every sixty seconds, and we'll do a hundred and forty-four plus a zero on the end, one thousand four hundred and forty. Um, and then this is uh, this is the number of minutes in a day, or perhaps you're going a little bit faster, thirty-second snapshots, and you've got twice the number. I find these two numbers fairly easy to remember. 144 is a gross in the old English terms. So um, then it's just a note in here, of course, um, if you have 1,500 1, stats per snapshot, then you're going to end up with 0.7 million, sorry, billion a year. Um, this is the number of snapshots. This is the number of stats. 
And if you've got a computer room with either 100 servers with 10 virtual machines or 10 machines with 100 virtual, virtual machines in it, then you're going to end up with 1 trillion stats in your uh, for this particular machine, uh, for uh, all the machines, you know, the 1,000 virtual machines uh, in here. So you can see that the numbers are growing up. And some people would want to run these tools a lot faster, but a bit of a warning in here, you know, 10 trillion stats, you work out how many bytes is in a stat. InfluxDB is pretty ruthless. I think it's eight bytes per stat or something. Um, but you're going to need a significant amount of uh, disk space to hold that. Um, if you only got a, one or two of these running fairly slowly, then, you know, a 64 gig disk will be fine. If you're into these sorts of numbers and lots of machines, then you probably want a terabyte or so to store your influx database. As by the way, these are the commands I like to use. Um, right. Now, if you like those sort of numbers, restarting NJMON every day is a little bit old school. That's what we did with NMON, um, because if you reboot the machine, it wouldn't start again if you're running it out of cron tab until midnight. So you could end up with like half a day's worth of missing stats, but it would at least pick it up and do it again. You could restart uh, nmon and work out how many seconds left in your day uh, to get to, the, to fill up if they overlapped a bit it doesn't hurt um but we tended to do that because in the, in the good old days when we started you have things like memory leaks it's good to restart a command um because it will free up all the memory from the old one and at midnight you start another one and in nmon uh, we like to have the idea of one gra one sorry file per day. Of course, then we end up with lots of files, which is always a problem when we were in people using nmon were used to having to move lots of files and having collections of thousands of files um, in the file system, and then working out which one they wanted to actually have a look at. Uh, with njmon, we don't, as far as I'm working out, there's... I haven't seen it leaking any memory. It would leak fairly fast given the number of snapshots we tend to do in a week or a month um, and the amount of stats that we're collecting. Um, so we tend to start NJMON or NIMON and let it run forever. And all we have to do is miss off that minus C option. And the count of the number of snapshots can go uh, missing. And... So that just makes life easier. Perhaps you put this in your etc. RC files to start up NJMON or NIMON when it reboots, as an example, and then you've got it, got it covered. Um, with NMON, um, we had regular problems with system admin people who noticed that NMON quite often, due to the amount of compute time it takes to run, um, actually overrun past the midnight and they try and, and kill their N1 at midnight um, on the dot to start the next one. It didn't actually hurt much. Um, but they used to write these shell scripts and get it wrong. <laughs> it's, again and again, this, this used to happen. And um, the other thing that people used to do is that N1, if they didn't like the file name that's used by default that I very, very carefully selected so that um, if you used an ls of a directory full of m1 files, they'd actually come out in, in, first of all, the host name order and then the time and date order, or date and time order. And so they're trying to generate their own ones, including putting the date out with the month in uh, alpha, uh, in, in letters, you know, like ju in E for June, and then when you list the files, they don't come out in the right order. But um, they used to write this script badly. Perhaps the script actually crashed, or perhaps the file name they generated it had spaces in it, and so the whole thing didn't work. And they, I used to get lots of emails saying, Edmond crashes immediately on startup. And then they showed me, I actually have to ask them exactly what was the command, and they eventually showed me the script, and I was saying, no, here's this. Here's the error in the script. But anyway, we're trying to avoid all that with uh, NJMON and NMON. Um, if you reboot, um, then you do have to restart NIMON or NJMON. It's easy to uh, forget, and perhaps you have a gap in your database of many hours. 
one thing we can just limit limit the damage um, is again use cron tab and using this minus k option. That's that k uh, says um, check if the previous copy of nmon is running. So how do you work out that? Well, you're not going to use the ps command. If you're on a very big machine, the ps command can take 20 minutes to run if you've got 10,000 processes running and you're overworked. So you don't want to do that. So what we do is when njmon or nimon starts up, it saves the PID in a directory, a slash temp slash njmon PID. So when we start the next one with a minus K, it looks in here, finds out the process ID of the previous one. Um, if it's still running, then it says, okay, uh, we will quietly stop this one that's just starting up because the original one's still running and we don't need to restart. Um, if it finds that it's not running, then okay, something must have happened. Maybe we did a reboot. Maybe somebody accidentally killed us. Um, so that it was, this new version will, will start up and carries on running, write its PID into the slash temp file. Um, in that case, you'll end up with 60 minutes of missing stats. You could get your cron tab to do this check every five minutes or something if you wanted to reduce that further. Now, not a lot of people know this, but um, if you use the kill command, we all know kill minus nine stops your process pretty darn quick. Um, and it's unavoidable unless your program is actually stuck in a device driver, but that's another question. Um, and if you though, want to test if a process is still running, you can send it the zero signal. Now, the zero signal doesn't exist, <laughs> but it does something clever. It will check to find out if that process ID is actually running, it's still available. Uh, but it doesn't actually send it a signal, which is nice. So you can write a command that says kill uh, minus zero and the PID, and it will tell you uh, if it's not there, you get an error message saying that PID doesn't exist. And if it is there, it just returns. So you can write a shell script that checks if the process is running still. Um, in a program, because we're not going to use the kill command to do this, uh, we're going to program this in C for speed. Um, but again, we can send the zero signal. We can detect if that process is still running or not without actually sending a signal. There's no chance of you accidentally killing anything. There we are. Not many people know that. But there we are. That, that works for AirX and Linux. Um, but then people start saying, well, what happens if I want to run more than one NJMON or NRMON uh, at the same time? Perhaps you want to run one that's doing collecting stats once a minute all day, every day. Uh, perhaps you want to run in your busy hour. Um, you perhaps you want the faster stats, maybe every 10 seconds for that busy hour. But we've only got one file. Um, perhaps you want to run two NJMONs and send the data to two different influx databases for you know sort of redundancy. Um, there are other techniques to do that. You can send the data to uh, Telegraph, which comes from the InfluxDB people. Um, and then you can have one input and two outputs going to two different databases. But that, um, two different NJ mods is a one way of doing it. Um, and some people don't like the slash temp because they have some tools. Um, it's, yeah, so I forgot to update this. There's some some people run regular tools to remove old stuff from slash temp. So if NJ mod was running for a week, you could accidentally delete a slash temp file. Uh, the next one that starts up says, well, I can't even find the file yet, alone the PID. Um, so it just starts up another one, and you end up with two copies of NJMON running. It doesn't actually harm, but uh, yeah, let's, let's try and avoid that. So now we have the uppercase K command, or option, NJMON minus uppercase K, and then you can name the file you want. Now, a lot of people tend to use things like... Uh, uh, var log to put these sorts of things and we and you'll find that other tools that are saving the pit of the process in there as well but you can decide wherever you want this and have two different file names if you want two copies running concurrently um, but notice um, var log you have to be the root user to create a file there so that, that's why i went for the minus temp option as a cheap and cheerful one with the 
minus little k option. So that, that's good. Uh, and these features, the, the minus h, capital H, and the minus capital K, are in the current version of uh, NJMON, which uh, was updated uh, middle last week. Okay. Another one in here, which uh, has been fixed, we have a thing called Spectrum Scale, or it used to be called GPFS, or it used to be called Multimedia something or other. There's MMs in a lot of the commands. Um, but anyway, it got renamed as Spectrum Scale. It's an IBM product. It's a bit like NFS on steroids. It does massive scaling, um, more than perhaps you'd want to do with NFS with uh, you know, tens of thousands of nodes. You can also have built-in recovery so that more than one node captures the data. So rather than NFS, which is one server normally farming out all the data to lots of uh, virtual machines, you could have a cluster of 10 spectrum scale servers to handle the workload. And on top of that, redundancy as well. So that if one node goes down, another node will start supplying the data. Um, so that's what NFS, uh, sorry, GPFS is all about. Um, and we have a feature in, in JMON and NM1 <clears throat> to that detects the uh, GPFS uh, monitoring commands and collects the stats for, from it. Now, unfortunately, the stats from GPFS are really weird. <laughs> you just really wonder what they were thinking. It's written very academically, I think. For large scale clusters, it's not easy to report, you know, if you have 10,000 machines in a cluster, what the performance of the cluster is like. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a fair comment. Um, but we're collecting the stats and we're saving these into EflexDB so you can monitor your GPFS in a much easier way with some graphs. Okay. Um, now, <laughs> and that worked fine. It's been going on for, for many months and uh, a lot of people are using it. Uh, we then find, um, however, if you stop GPFS and JMON crashes, because I didn't think anybody would stop GPFS. If you've got a vitally important shared a file system like this, it usually becomes fairly critical that it's up. But we have customers that shut it down regularly, uh, perhaps for maintenance at the weekend or something. So I had to go and fix the bug uh, in there. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, so I've done that, so we're okay with that. Um, it actually, once it detects that GPFS is off, it stops collecting the stats for GPFS. In a later release, I might restart GPFS stats uh, once we find them going. But I don't really want to go through the loop of every single snapshot um, attempting to, you know, we'll notice the commands available, we'll have to try and connect to that command it returns back some odd results, or maybe it just doesn't return back anything. And I've got to work out what the bad results are of uh, GPFS is installed, but it's not actually running at the moment. And then uh, perhaps we'll end up trying and attempting a restart every 10 minutes or something in the stats. So we don't do this every single time because it's likely to spend some time uh, having to time out a non-return of the stats. Anyway, that's for a future release, but at least we can survive now GPFS being switched off. The people that are good at GPFS, if they switch it the off, they take the latest version, version 66, um, and then uh, if they restart GPFS, they can restart NJMON to start collecting the stats. So we're halfway house at the moment, but at least it uh, doesn't uh, crash NJMON. If I used to crash NJMON and if you start it up again, so it finds the commands, but they're not available. <laughs> it needs to crash again. So we're in a better position, but not restarting the stats at the moment. All right, completely different topic now. Uh, Nmon, which is mine, but this is Nflux, Nmon 2 Influx. So this was started by a, a chap called uh, Alan uh, Dijoux, perhaps. That's the, how you say his name. And um, uh, in 2016. So full marks. I didn't start using InfluxDB to 2018. Um, so this is not one of my tools. Uh, it's using uh, nmon to get the data, and then you feed the nmon files into this tool, and it uploads the data 
available in Enmon. Now, Enmon has a lot less stats than NJmon. That's the first internet, so lots of it will, stuff will go missing. And you have to deal with moving all these files about, about perhaps using NFS to get all the files to a local place. And then once a day, you, you load the data into uh, InfluxDB. Um, so that, that that's okay, and I wouldn't recommend you using this tool uh, because we now have NJMon that does that live. The data goes immediately into the database for you to graph rather than having to deal with lots, hundreds or thousands of NMON files. In its day, it was very good. But it comes with a little twist in here, right? Uh, for power servers only, uh, you have the option of a different tool in the same package, if you like, uh, that connects to the HMC and it gets some server stats and some LPAR, or virtual machine level stats. Now, these are very limited. It tends to be for the LPARs, the, um, the number of CPUs allocated to the LPAR and like the size of memory allocated to the LPAR, but nothing about what they're actually doing. How much of that is used? How much of memory is actually used, for example? Um, but the uh, the nice thing is that that does include the IBM I stats. We don't have a way of collecting IBM I stats and putting those into the InfluxDB. So his extra extra tools then connect to the HMC, get this small amount of data, but it is sort of complete. So you can see how big he, how busy your actual servers are and what your virtual machines, including the IBM I ones that we can't monitor otherwise. So some useful data in here, of course, if you're collecting server level stats and you start moving your virtual machines between stats, uh, at least this will be like a constant telling you what this particular hardware server is doing um, all the time. Okay, so limited stats, but I think quite useful. So. Uh, this is uh, not really related to the Enmon part of it. It's, it's another command or different options to the same commands and putting it into the into the InfluxDB package. Now, I get people asking me about that, and I, well, it's not my tool. Um, but I do have a tooling to get the same HMC stats. Um, I created something uh, about 2016. I wouldn't. Plus or minus two years, um, called N Extract that could do this uh, sort of information. It used to pull out the data in comma separated values um, and uh, text and uh, into uh, pump the data into um, InfluxDB. So I could get those uh, tools back out. Uh, it's open source, it's available to you, and uh, clean it up a bit perhaps for a the uh, same, you wouldn't want to put this data into the NJMON database. We created a different database for perhaps servers and another one for the HMC uh, details of the actual virtual machines. But we could uh, we could do that. Um, I suspect that he might have used my N-Extract Python scripts because I think he's using Python to actually get the data as well. But I, not a problem. It's all open source. There's no problem with that. So what do you think? Do you think it would be very useful for NJMON users to have uh, a reworked and extract tools to collect the server stats and the LBAR stats? I don't think it's a lot of work. It's just sort of cleaning that up a bit and uh, making sure that it's going to work uh, reliably. You'd run the Python programs on the N. <laughs> on the influx database machine, probably, uh, because you'd want to access to Python that's not typically on AIX. Although we do now have Python in the AIX open source toolbox, so you could run Python uh, there if you wanted to. Okay, so just looking for some feedback. If you think it's useful, contact me. Details are on the first page um, or I think it's on the last page as well. So if you look at the Grafana dashboard website, uh, you can find the NJ moments by typing it in here. And there's one an example here. This was 11 up until a week ago. Um, and uh, there's a whole bunch of the graphs. Some of them I created, some of them my friends have created for NJMon. These are the ones uh, I've created. And 
this is a problem that was reported to me. They, they downloaded this, uh, one of my templates, and they get full of NAs, and they say, what's wrong? It's horrible. And the answer is, it's not your fault. <laughs> it's my fault, if you like. Uh, the problem is these NAs can be fixed if you edit each of the graphs and change format as to table. This is a, uh, a newer a, a feature that's in newer versions of uh, Grafana. So it doesn't understand it if it's a slightly older template, and then it all works fine. So I, I downloaded the, the one that was, wasn't working, made these changes, uh, format as table, and then uploaded it back at version 64, and that's that's all fixed. So you can actually download these now. So if you find these NAs everywhere, don't worry, you need to sharpen it up. Let me know, and I'll go and do it and upload the, the new template before. So... This is what I did in here. You went to each of these ones and said, output it as a table rather than a graph, and then they all start working fine. Okay, here's my to-do list. Uh, last but one chart. Um, so secure sockets for NIMON has been uh, requested. We also, if you're using NJMON and the NJMON D, the, the daemon process that accepts the incoming data and pushes it into InfluxDB, um, that we could do some more multi-threading monitoring. If things get really bad with it, it sort of runs out of threads, but we can actually monitor the amount of threads it's got and start more of them up if need be. And I'm looking at some way of using like a ping monitoring free IP address. It's just useful for me. And even looking at response times, we can find the slower uh, logical partitions. If um, they're overworked, the response times will go up. And if a virtual machine goes offline, <laughs> then perhaps we can generate alerts saying, whoa, this was working, and now it's not. Is this expected or not uh, from the Grafana dashboards? Again, let me know what you think. Uh, one more t thing is that uh, we've added uh, for Nmon chart the uh, shared Ethernet adapter. So if you're collecting the stats from N Nmon, um, if you want to use Nmon charts, the, the three more graphs in here for C kilobytes per second packets and the amount of stuff coming in over a, a uh, C and going out on the physical network. Okay, there's the details there. Okay. Um, we also <laughs> found a bunch of bugs in the libpostout library. These have been reported, and I'm sure the Eric's guys or uh, development team will fix these in. Uh, as as quickly as possible. We also noticed some horrible things like um, <laughs> this is bad style of C code for int equals <laughs> uh, int i. That's, I've never ever seen somebody define a variable inside a for loop like that before. Um, the GCC compiler complains that it is valid but only for a old so source code. And um, they're also in an example program here simple adapter stats example code they're actually doing the calculations wrong so hopefully you'll fix that for us as well uh, here's the source code of my program that proves the the problems oh yes this is a point um influx database is now available on aix you download it from power minus sign develop ops.com and i've been asked how do i install that the answer is well i've never installed it on aix so i don't know but here's some notes that will hopefully get you uh, going. And we've got to be careful because most people will want to run the InfluxDB client module in, in Python. So we'll have to make sure that's available as well. So expect more news on that next time. I also wanted to write uh, Nmon, Nimon, uh, a quick rein approach. This is what I'd recommend for your first time to get it working and then try more esoteric uh versions or hardware or the more complicated way of uh, running this but that's still on my to-do list for a youtube video next time okay that's it next meeting is the 6th of october and uh, if you've got questions or feedback please uh, let me know two email addresses there or mr n1 on twitter or linkedin is there as well thank you very much for your time